Good morning again, everyone. So today, um, we're not going to talk about work or anything like that. So I know some people think, oh, it's a Labor Day weekend, we'll talk about work and that kind of thing. I think some of the last messages I've made have been more about serving and serving the church and work. So I figured I'd do something a little bit different today. And when I was trying to think about something to uh, discuss this morning and, and, and to do the message on, um, the idea of family kind of kept coming to mind, to my mind. And then I thought what even more so was more appropriate just because of yesterday uh, with my father getting married yesterday. Um, and kind of the idea of the joining of two new families together as one family and how important family is, and that's kind of what I, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, just had, you know, the, the, you know, God leading me to talk, kind of talk about this morning, especially I think with so much that's going on in the world today, just the importance of, of, of the idea of family itself. But I'm going to take it in a little bit of a different direction, okay, because basically what we're going to talk about today is um, out of uh, Matthew chapter 12, 46 uh, through 50, and um, kind of leading up to this, Jesus is kind of preaching a great deal. He's performed some miracles. He's dealt with some of the Pharisees. Um, he's um, exercised a demon and everything. So a lot of it's kind of gone on here in this little bit of time. And then he gets to this message talking about the, the family, itself, family itself. And so if you'll stand with me as we read God's Word, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. And someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing abide asking to speak to you. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Let us pray. Lord, Father God. We just thank you again today, Father God, to be here just to, to read your word, Father God, to hear your word, Father God, and to impart it into our hearts. And Father God, as we are here this morning to understand the meaning of this text, of the scripture itself, Father God, we ask that you just open up our hearts and minds and the spirit to your words, to your wisdom, to your power and glory, Father God, to see that the importance of family that you instilled so long ago, uh, long ago with Adam and Eve and the importance of it is today. But not just the immediate family, not just our blood family, but also our spiritual family, Father God, as you will point out to us soon here. And so, Father God, I ask that you just continue to be with us, Father God, to meet the needs that we have. And we just thank you for your love and grace and kindness upon us, Father God. For it's all these things we lift up in your sons and we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. Thank you again. And so some of you might be asking, okay, so family is very, very important, right? Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, all that good stuff, all right? Some of us are very close, some of us not as close as we might like, or maybe some of us don't want to be close with them. You know, I have some members of my own family, my blood family, that I love them, I don't necessarily like them, we don't have a close relationship for a lot of different reasons. I've moved on, I've passed, I've forgiven, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but, you know, and sometimes it's a distance thing. You have family that lives a long way, and it's kind of hard. Now, today, it's probably a little bit easier with, like, Facebook and social media and all that good stuff, right? Uh, so it's a little bit easier to keep up with people. I know long ago, I have a lot of family that lives out of town in Wyoming, Colorado, uh, Missouri, Kansas, and, and such as that. And so it's a little bit easier to keep up with them on Facebook and everything. Uh, but then I got married, and my wife does all that, so I'm hardly ever on Facebook anymore having to deal with it. She'll keep me up to date and everything about what's going on in my family's life, and then she posts enough stuff for both of us. They can keep up to date with me and what's going on in my life. Yeah. And so family is very, very important. Okay? I mean, we see this as God institutes it in Genesis 2 with, the, with Adam and Eve as, as marriage is created itself. Not just we see the creation of the world, of the universe, of everything, humanity, but also we see the creation of marriage and how important it is and the designation of it as the foundation of social order. The, found, the family is going to be the foundation for society itself. Okay, and everything starts with mom and dad. Okay? And then we see the relationship of even Cain and Abel and how, uh, distract, how distraughtful that was as, as Cain killed his own brother. And so we see from the very beginning, because of sin itself, that family is important, but family is not perfect. Okay? 
we have our issues, we have our grievances, we have our jealousies and everything, but we also have our love. You know, we can't forget that we are created in the image of God and we do love. And we should love. And we can love. And so that's why we do love our brothers, or our, our parents, our siblings, our children, regardless of what they do in their lives. It's as we kind of read from the scripture reading this morning from Ephesians, the importance of honoring our parents, but then also in itself the relationship that we have as a parent to discipline our children with respect and with regard and with love. Okay? And so when we get to this verse, we're probably thinking, man, it's like, you know, Jesus is doing so much. Like we talked about, he healed somebody's hand, he exercised a demon, he's you know, kind of telling the Pharisees what he's going to do as a sign of Jonah, that what, three days he's going to be resurrected, um, kind of pointing to his resurrection. And so much is going on, then, then bam, all of a sudden we hit this like this little, what seems kind of anticlimactic, right? And it's like he's doing all these great things, performing all these miracles, doing a great teaching and a study and, and a great message, and then he's interrupted by his family. And it's kind of like, man, that was just like an abrupt ending, right? It's kind of like stole all of his gust, stole all of his wind. Like he was, he was on such a roll and they just kind of put an end to it. But we kind of look at it, it's like, did, did they really though? Okay. So the first thing I want to look at is when we look at verses 46. Now some of your Bible verses, some of your, depending on your translation, you might have a verse 47, you may not have a verse 47. I have an ESV, it does not have a verse 47, it just kind of goes 46 and 48. Okay. It is not a misprint, that's just what it is. Some of the, some translations kind of felt 46 and verse 47 were the same thing, so it didn't really need it. That's just the reason. Doesn't negate the importance of Scripture or the Word of God, okay? So I just want to make sure that's clear, all right? So when we look at verse 46, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. It's like, man, Jesus is on such a roll. Why do you want to come and interrupt what he's doing? He's got the people, he's got the people moving. He's got the Spirit going, and people are understanding who he is and what he's come to do. And then if you have a verse 47, it says, Someone told him, Your mother and your brothers are standing abide asking to speak to you. In verse 48, he, But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now this is not a way in which he is asking, like, does he have multiple parents? Does he have multiple brothers? He does have several brothers. And it's not like in a, in a, in a general term, like, you know, I have an uncle who is not a blood uncle, but he's been my dad's best friend since they were like five years old. So they grew up like brothers, and so we refer to him as like uncle. And then I have my own extended family, so to speak. I have a bunch of people, uh, young uh, men in my life, my age that I went to high school with, grew up with, that I would refer to like my brothers. They are not my blood brothers, but they're like family. And I'm sure we all have people like that, right? It's people you call sisters that are like sisters um, and, and things like that, okay? So it's nothing like that. But basically what he's asking is he's kind of getting them to think. He wants them to understand something. That while family is important... There's another, there's something that's a little bit more important. Okay, it's not just the blood, but something spiritual that's going to take place here. And if we go back and look at Mark 3.21, and you don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you. This is kind of the same thing in Mark. The Gospel of Mark and, the, um, and Matthew, what we're reading, is kind of going on at the same time. But this is Mark's perspective. Okay, So from Mark 3.21, he says, uh, I'll start at 20. Then he went home to the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Speaking about Jesus, okay? Now this is Mary, his mom, his brothers, James, John being a couple of them, and whoever else. Knowing who Jesus is, Mary most importantly knowing who Jesus is from the Immaculate Conception, right? Knows that he is the savior of the human race, and yet she is still worried about Jesus going out there and ministering to people. Because they think he's gone crazy. No, Jesus has not gone crazy. Jesus has gone divine, okay? Because he is the Son of God. And so one of the first things that we need to take from this scripture, from these couple verses, is this. If I get there. Jesus should not be an embarrassment to us. How many times in your own life have you thought about, I want to preach, I want to tell about the gospel, I want to do this, I want to do that for Christ, and, but I don't because we might be embarrassed, because we might say the wrong thing, we may not know the words to say, this person may not be my friend after that anymore, whatever it might be for you. We have missed an opportunity and a point in our lives where basically we became embarrassed of Jesus. Okay? And I, I'm guilty of it too, all right? 
But here's his family who was there. And keep in mind, they witnessed, they just witnessed all these miracles happening. And they still couldn't fathom who Jesus was and what he was doing and the message he was preaching and who he was as the Son of God and who he is as the Son of Man. They're completely embarrassed about it. And maybe you can think of it culturally, contextually. Maybe they had a reason. Maybe it's okay. Because keep in mind, Joseph is not mentioned anymore. Pretty much after we see um, Jesus getting left behind at the, at the temple and he's kind of teaching and showing, sharing off his wisdom and people are impressed by him. And then, I mean, and keep in mind, Mary and Joseph will probably have traveled several days before they realize they left Jesus. Okay? So they travel back find him. They kind of scold him a little bit. And Jesus is like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like, so you can't really get mad at me. So he's not being disrespectful. He's just saying, hey, like, this is what I came for. Okay? I'm here to be a messenger of the people, for the people. And so Joseph is not here anymore. And so basically it falls on to, um, culturally, it falls on to Jesus to be the head of the family. He's the one that's going to support them. He's the one that's going to Um, help them survive and all these things and so they are a little upset and maybe understandably to a degree like hey you have a role as the eldest son of this family to provide and take care of mom and take care of us younger brothers this is what you're supposed to do now but again we know jesus he breaks those cultural barriers he's like that's not my role anymore my role as the son of god is to tell about people about deliverance and salvation and what they can have through me and what they get to have through me is God and the only way to talk about that is if I am sharing the message and preparing the people because he goes all the way back talking about John the Baptist if you go back to like verse uh, chapter 11 I believe it was now he starts hey he is like the greatest of the great of all the prophets of everybody that's gone before me he is the greatest but even still he is the least of what you will be because the least will become greater, and the greatest will become least. The first will be last, the last will be first, all that kind of stuff all summed up into that message. And that's what Jesus is talking about there. And then he goes on and do some of those miracles as we suggested. But again itself, how are we living our lives in, 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 our, cult, in our cultural context? You know, here in America, we do have the right, we do have the, the freedom to exercise our faith, our Christian beliefs. So yeah, we can pray openly. We can be in school and pray if you're in high school or junior high. There's nothing wrong with you about praying or sharing the gospel itself. For some of you that may be in secular jobs, it might be a little bit harder. I am bivocational. I work in a restaurant, but I still have the opportunity to pray with others if they want it, and I do it. They will come to me. We will discuss things about God and Jesus or whatever they might want to discuss. And I've done that. Just this weekend, I went and we, uh, my family, while we were up in Austin this weekend, we, we traveled up there Friday afternoon, did the rehearsal, stayed in our hotel, and then fr- the, we didn't have to be back at the church until um, 2 o'clock, and so I have some friends that moved up to Austin about a year ago. We went and had lunch with them, okay? friends that I knew from when I, my days at Roadhouse, and, um, it's, um, and, and, and one of them is an atheist. Okay, me and her have had, she's still a good friend. She is an atheist. She's very, um, she's not like aggressive about it, I guess, so to speak. Um, but she just has some qualms about some things of the Christian faith. Okay, okay. Me and her have tossed, talked about things. We've hashed some things out. Uh, we've never had like arguments or anything like that. But we have a mutual respect for each other's beliefs. Okay. She still loves me. I still love her. And so before we have lunch, I say, is it okay if we pray? Can we pray before the meal? And she prays with us. Okay, and I asked for a blessing on them, a blessing on the food, a blessing on the situation, and all these things. But the thing is, I'm not embarrassed about Jesus, and she knows that. If she wanted to say, "Hey, I don't want to pray," I'm like, "Okay, well, me and my family are still going to pray. We want to include you in this, but if you don't want to, that's okay. But we are still going to do it." You see, sometimes we are so afraid about certain things that we don't want to execute what God has commanded us to do. See, we see here Jesus is not afraid to execute what God is wanting him to do. He doesn't care about what his mom thinks. He doesn't care about what his brothers think. He doesn't care about what society thinks about him. Even moments ago, he's preaching to the Pharisees and Sadducees about the signs of Jonah, about the coming of the resurrection. 
He doesn't care about what society thinks because he's here to do something else. And that's to deliver a message, to deliver the gospel, to show the world who God truly is through him and through his message and through his teachings. Because that's the way we can only really do it. We need to keep in mind that society itself is a secular view and is evil. Okay? The enemy has control of that. So if we don't want to fall into those traps and to be ensnared by the enemy, we have to recognize that we cannot be embarrassed by Jesus. And that's what the enemy will do. He wants you to be embarrassed about Jesus. So that way you can't go out there and do the work that God has commanded you to do. When you go back and look at the temptations, when Jesus is being encountered by Satan, he's trying to make Jesus almost embarrassed about it. It's like, well, you're God, you're Father. He doesn't have the power to do all this. He can't do this. You can't do that. But Jesus says, yes, he can and he will. And I can and I will. Because Jesus is not embarrassed about it. And so we have to recognize that what is going on. Okay? So that's verses 46, 47, 48. And now let's get into verse 49. He says, and stretching out his hand towards his disciples, these are the people that he's preaching to, He said, here are my mother and my brothers. See, now he's taking this a whole different level. He says, yes, that's my mother. Biologically, that's my mom. Those are my brothers. But in reality, you people here stretching out my hands are my brothers and sisters and my mothers. And what that tells us is that Jesus is not embarrassed about us. Jesus is dining with sinners. Jesus is dining with tax collectors. Jesus is healing people on the Sabbath that are in pain and agonizing. Jesus is exercising demons because he's not embarrassed, because he loves us. He has such grace and astounding and love for us that he doesn't care who we are, what we've done, where we've come from, where we're going, that he stops and takes the time for each and every one of us. He did it with the woman at the well. He did it with um, so many other occasions. He just stopped, took the time, and ministered. Because he is not embarrassed by us. So if he's not embarrassed by us, and, and by all rights he should be, okay, because the church as a whole has done horrible, embarrassing things. That's still, and still today it does. I don't mean this church locally. I mean the church as a whole. We have done things that should outright embarrass Jesus, should outright be ashamed. But he still calls us his brothers and sisters, his mothers, his fathers, okay? Because he knows that the importance of family is this, this family that's here gathering together across all the other churches that are gathering together this morning or gathering together later this evening or this afternoon or even last night or whenever, Whenever we are gathering together in fellowship in the name of Christ, Jesus is, if anything, proud and excited and jubilant about what we are doing in his name. And that's what we have to kind of attach ourselves to. We shouldn't attach ourselves to the embarrassing things we've done. Because again, that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to hold on to those things so that we second guess and we make ourselves feel guilty and then we don't do what God is commanding us to do. Jesus, I can't minister the gospel because I'm addicted to drugs or I'm a drunkard or I look at pornography all the time or I'm a gossip or I'm a liar or whatever. I can't do what you need me to do because I've done these things that are horrible. Jesus says, yeah, you've done some bad things, but I still love you. And I still want you out there ministering and helping people and serving in the kingdom of God. I want you as my brother. I want you as my sister. Because that's how important this family is to him. If we go back and look, again, Genesis, right? Marriage, Adam and Eve getting married. And then we look at today, the church. We are the bride of Christ, right? We are the bride of Christ. And if God instituted marriage so important long ago, and it was that important to do it with the very first couple this universe, this world has ever known, and if we see, like, that's how important marriage is, right? and how perfect God wanted it to be, and then we look at ourselves today and how we are the bride of Christ and we are married to Jesus and the importance of the relationship there and how we today 
can see how important we are to society today. Because if there is no church, if there is no Jesus, how far down the rabbit hole do you think the church, the world itself would have gone? I'll tell you, because it was going right down the rabbit hole right before Noah and the flood. And we can say, like, well, the world's the worst that it's ever been. I haven't seen a flood in a long time. I know sometimes it rains a lot. We need a lot of it here right now. But I don't know if the world's ever been that bad right now. Because things were pretty bad to where God was like, mm, maybe I should do a do-over. But no, he found favor with Noah and started over with him and his family. Because God knows it's, it's, this is what's important. His creation, his people, we are important to him because he loves us. But there's only one way we can really truly become brothers and sisters of Christ. Okay? And basically that's this, verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. See, if we want to be part of this relationship, our obedience grants us that relationship to Jesus. And with that relationship with Jesus, we have the relationship with God that we need. Because Jesus says, none can go through the Father except through me. So there might be other people or other avenues of the faith that say you can get to heaven without knowing Jesus. That is, no, you can't. Jesus makes it very clear. And as Christians, as a pillar of our faith, it's very clear that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have God. And one of the things that we've been talking about in, in Sunday school with the youth is we're going through Proverbs, okay? And one of the things that we discussed this morning was that if you don't know God, you hate God. And if you hate God, you love death. Basically, you love sin, you love death. We know that the wages of sin is death, right? But if you love God's wisdom, then you love God, then you hate evil. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're not going to sin anymore. But it understands, and we understand that we have this obedience to God. That we have to be obedient to him. So everything I want, anything I want to do, the life I want to live and how I want to do things, I have to give up. Because for one, how I want to do things is probably not always the best. I'll say 99% of the times it is not the best. Because I want to do it for myself, I want to do it for my greed, I want to do it for my ego, I want to do it for my pride. But if I look at it and I want to do things for God's will then I know whatever God has laid out for me is perfect. It's long-lasting. It's life that's abundant. It may not be like the most materialistic life. I may not have the most money, but I'd rather have quality over quantity anyway. Okay? Now, I can't promise you you're going to have like the best things in the world. And I'll be honest, like I'm looking at my life now and granted, I'm only 37 years old, and I know I'm not that old, and I know I have a lot to learn. But it's like, the, the older I've gotten, the more I realize, it's like, I don't really need as much as I wanted. And really, honestly, all that's, that, that's a mentality that's come from God. I can live a much simpler life. Now, I'm not saying I still don't want things from time to time, okay? But that's just the flesh, but I know that the more obedient I am to God, I know the more he's going to bless me. And I, again, I don't mean blessings in money and monetary and stuff and materials. I just know that God is going to bless me with more peace, more wisdom, more understanding, more grace, more love, more patience. All these things that have much more value than money and stuff. So we have to look at what is so important why is this so important? Because Jesus wants to have community with you. Jesus wants you to be part of that family. You know, again, when I was talking about my father getting married yesterday, you know, one of the things that, you know, uh, my wife has asked me, is it weird that your dad's getting married? And I said, I mean, it's not because, you know, him and my mother separated um, several years um, like, my mom passed away like 10 years ago, okay? So from her battle with cancer and everything. And then they had probably separated like maybe 15 years ago, roughly. Okay, because she, she probably, 
They had separated, then she was diagnosed with cancer uh, shortly after, and then she battled cancer about five years. So it's probably been about 15 to 16 years since they had separated, okay? Um, and so, I mean, it's not really weird for me just because it's been so long. I mean, if my mom was still alive and they had just gotten, like, separated like a year ago, then yeah, it'd probably be a little weird, you know? But the thing is, like, I see how happy my dad is. I'm happy for him. He found himself a good woman, a, a good Christian woman, which is even more important. And so I'm happy for him. I'm happy for her. They have a great relationship. And so, yeah, and, and the idea is that, like, I mean, for a lot of them, I just met her family for, like, the first time this weekend. But there's, like, more family now, you know? And it's like, this is like another grandmother for my son, you know, because now that somebody else that will be in his life that will love him and, 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 and care for him. You know, same thing for my daughter, another grandmother for her to have. And the thing is, I've always told myself that the more people that are in a person's life that love them, the better. And when you have Jesus in your life and he loves you, whether you want to admit that he loves you or not, Jesus loves you regardless. Whether you admit there is a Jesus, whether you admit there is a God, whether you're atheist, agnostic, or worship some other false gods or whatever, Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross so you can be part of God's family. Because once we acknowledge and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are adopted into God's family. And that's what Jesus is getting at. He says, when you do this, when you are obedient to God and his will, just as God, Jesus was, obedient to God's will to go on the cross and die for our sins, we are a part of that family. And as part of that family, we have an extended amount of brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I have two blood brothers and other, brother, other men in my life that I consider like brothers, that I went to high school with, graduated, all that kind of good stuff. Probably like another four or five or six guys. But then I look out in this crowd and I have like another hundred or so brothers and sisters in Christ. Knowing Christ just expands your family exponentially. And when you have that support system, it's just amazing knowing that there are other theirs that are there for you. Other people that have most likely gone through and been through the same things that you have. You know, I can, I can go to my two brothers and say, hey, I'm dealing with this. But if they've never dealt with that, they really wouldn't know what I'm dealing with. So it's hard for them to kind of support me. And then my other extended brothers that I have, I could probably go to them, another five or six guys, and maybe one, of their t one maybe two of them do, but it's still maybe not as, not as much. But then I can look out into this crowd, into the church, and see I have other people here, a whole other support system I can go to and see, hey, can you support me in this? Have you been through this? Do you know what I'm kind of going through and dealing with? And I might have like 20 of y'all that do. And the thing to keep in mind is, no matter what you are going through in your life, Jesus has been through it. And I'm talking about, like, no matter what you are going through. Because sometimes we look at the cross and his arrest and, 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 the, and the walk up the hill and bearing that cross and how he's beaten and tortured, but there's a lot more stuff that went on that I won't get into that was pretty bad stuff. And so you might ask and question yourself, I don't know if Jesus has been through that. I can guarantee you he probably did. The family that we have today, the family that you have in Christ is so important. And that's what I wanted to, that's what I, I felt God was wanting me to make this about. Especially in this time, we were looking at Labor Day weekend, people were all taking the time off, getting to spend time with family and that kind of stuff. And so don't take it for granted. You know, use the opportunity that you have to spend time and to get to know and to minister and, and, and preach and share the gospel when you have it. We should not be embarrassed about Jesus because he is not embarrassed about us. And if we want to know Jesus, if we want to have that relationship with Jesus, we have to be obedient to the Father. And so being obedient means giving up everything that I want to do. And so maybe you're out here in the crowd today and say, you know what, I've never really been obedient to Jesus. I've never been obedient to God. I've lived my life the way I wanted to, but now if I really want to have this life, if I want to have this extra life, this extra family, this extra support system that God is talking about, then I need to do that. And you can do that today. In a moment here, we're going to have an invitation where you can come down the aisle 
and just come and profess in front of, your, in front of everybody here to say, I want to be obedient to God, and I want to give my, submit my life to Christ. And we'll walk you through that process, and you can do that and, and talk about baptism and how that works. Or maybe you're a person that's been baptized, you've been searching for a church and looking for a home to, to call yourself, a, have a part of a family, and you're thinking, man, today's the day I want to do that. I want to be part of this church. I want to be part of this family. I want to have this support system that I'm in so desperate need of. And you can buy that by statement of faith, transfer a letter, whatever you have. Or maybe you just need prayer. Maybe there's something you're in prayer about, and you want to come up here, and I'll pray with you. The choice is yours, and we'll be up here for you. So let us pray. Lord, Father God, again, we just thank you for the family that you give us, Father God. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, to hear your message, to hear your word, Father God. And just to see, and thank you for the families that we do have, the people that we were born to, the father and mother. And, and we know they weren't perfect, Father God, but they're who you placed us with. And the, the brothers and sisters that we might have had, or we do have, again, no family is perfect, Father God. But we see that your son, Jesus, here, you know, as, as family members, we should not be embarrassed about Jesus. As believers, as Christians, we should go out there into the world and preach the gospel of your son, Jesus, and what it means with, with boldness and with firmness and with courage and with strength that can only come from you. Because we also see that God, Jesus is not embarrassed by us. He wants us, despite our flaws, despite our sins, despite our, our insecurities, Father God, he wants us. And he is not embarrassed by that. But we can only have that relationship with your son Jesus is by being obedient to you, Father God. So if there's anybody here that has not made that obedience to you, that has not submitted their will to your son Jesus, then let them do that now, Father God. Let them proclaim that they want to know the family that you can only give them. They want to know the family that, delivered, that your son promised them in these words. And Father God, we just continue to pray for this church and for the Awana ministry as it is about to begin. That you'll bring the, the things that are needed, the volunteers as well, that you'll provide in these areas, Father. For a pastor in Australia, for their trip to Israel, for the, the Mary Hill Davis, for all the other things that are going on across this, this, this church and everything else, Father God, that you'll just continue to provide and bless. Because it's not for us, it's for you. And so that your work can be done so that your blessings can flow, so people can know more about your son Jesus, and so that that family can grow bigger.